Hey everybody, welcome back to Found Flicks. I know it's been a bit since I've uploaded as I've been on vacation the past couple weeks, but now I'm back and ready to rock with a whole bunch of new videos coming your way. So let's kick things off with the new superhero horror film Brightburn, where a child from another world with Superman-like powers turns out he ain't no hero at all, but something much more sinister. The idea of the film is basically that. What if Superman were evil? Which is a pretty weird high concept for a movie in and of itself. Not something we've really seen too much of in the superhero genre. An obvious subversion of the standard Superman origin story. And that's about all the movie has going for it. It's a much more simplistic and slight film overall than I anticipated. Really only working on that basic level and not much else. While it definitely has its fair share of problems, like incredibly dumb characters who make terrible decisions all the time, and a bare bones plot that leaves many more interesting concepts unexplored, it still works to me and what it set out to be, an anti-hero horror film that plays like what if instead of Michael Myers or the like, our slasher is a super being from another world. These aspects to the movie are all well done. The horror-esque scenarios are tense and thrilling, also boasting some surprisingly over-the-top gore that is always welcome in my book. However, it still left me wanting more, particularly in regard to how simple the story is, and there are many grander ideas that feel dropped without much consideration. As such, there are many questions left in the end that I will do what I can to tie together, because even the main point of why the kid is here in the first place doesn't really get the attention it deserves. So let's dig into Brightburn, exploring the overall movie and its concepts, what some of the bigger missing pieces to the story are, and explaining the ending that opens the possibilities wide open for a sequel. We open on a farm in the middle of nowhere in the small rural town of Brightburn, Kansas, where a couple Tori and Kyle are attempting attempting to conceive a child. Based on several books strewn around the house related to pregnancy and fertility, it appears that they haven't had much luck so far in that regard, and perhaps they are unable to have a child of their own. That will all change in a moment though, when a sound is heard outside by Tori, drawn outside to a glowing red, still smoking object that has crashed there. We don't see the immediate aftermath, instead flashing forward through the life of a young boy Brandon, their adopted child, who was discovered in the crash. The object that brought him not a meteor, but in fact his spaceship. Though it does seem odd anyone who finds a kid in a crashed spaceship would have the first thought of, sure, let's adopt him as our own. But if the previous indicators of them not being able to have a kid are true, this helps us understand their motivations. And in a sense, it could feel as though their long-held prayers for a child have been answered from the heavens above. Even though he's from space and tactically an alien, he on the surface appears to look like any regular boy. And throughout his early years, there seems to have been no strange incidents tied to his origins. Though when discussing him, Kyle mentions that he has never bled or gotten a cut or bruise of any kind, something that would be impossible for any average kid to avoid. We then pick up with the family on the verge of Brandon's 12th birthday, and things begin to quickly turn sour as he approaches the hormone-fueled age of puberty. Ugh which is where he first shows signs of being something far different and powerful than a human being. One night on the farm, Brandon is awoken to strange growling distorted voices, causing him to convulse violently in his bed, his eyes changing to a piercing red glowing color. In a daze, he sleepwalks out to a nearby barn, drawn to a locked trap door, more red light glowing from underneath. It's his spaceship his parents have kept hidden from him down there all these years, and it seems to be kind of awakening the alien side of his physical body. Tugging at the chains on the doors and chanting angrily, Tori finds him and manages to calm him down. The boy snapping back to his regular self, asking his mother where he is, unaware of what he's been doing, showing a divide exists internally between the boy and his true self for now. Another incident lets us see just how powerful the boy is when his father asks him to mow the yard. A frustrated Brandon launches the lawnmower high into the air, landing at least a hundred feet away. The blades still spinning, he curiously sticks his hand into them, which breaks them on impact, but leaving him without a scratch. And his darker and more detached nature becomes more predominant, not even answering his father when sitting silently chewing on a fork, which has been mangled in his mouth, though has no effect on his teeth whatsoever. 
forever. Tori and Kyle chalk his strange behavior up to his changing body. I remember when I ate forks when I was 12 and decided to take him on a family camping trip. And his dad awkwardly tries to explain to him about growing attracted to girls and that it's okay to play with his penis. As I said, awkward. And Brandon, not fully understanding the right way to go about this, disappears into the night, showing up at the house of a classmate he has a crush on, at least setting the romantic mood with some nice music on her computer, which even after she shuts it down, opens itself up and continues playing. Caitlin getting frightened. She freaks when catching a glimpse of Brandon amongst the window curtains. But just as quickly as he appeared, he vanishes. Back in the woods, Tori and Kyle search for him and discover him nearby brushing off their concerns of his whereabouts, saying he was just using the bathroom. Nice cover up, buddy, though he won't be able to hide his changes much longer. At school, scribbling a series of odd symbols into a notebook, which looked like two Bs like his initials opposite each other, along with a rudimentary mask and costume sketch. His mom catches a peek, complimenting him on his skill, but instead of answering her, he angrily closes the book and rushes off. Secret secrets, Brandon. His path to full blown murder almost perfectly aligns with that of a serial killer, later found in the barn by Kyle staring blankly at their chickens, all freaking out in his presence, though he assures his dad he's fine. Later that night, we discover how very wrong that is when Kyle is awoken to noises and bright lights at the barn, coming to the chicken cage and finding them all brutally mutilated. The door and lock ripped off. Kyle tries to confront Tori about it, thinking it must have been Brandon responsible, but she refuses to believe that her baby boy could do something that horrible, and blames a wolf. Despite a wolf not being able to, you know, rip a door off, showing us how much he truly cares about him, turning a blind eye to the many indicators that there is definitely something off about him. His violence only gets worse from here. The next day at school, turning to his first human victim, doing a trust fall exercise in gym class, the others all push him back as instructed, except for Caitlin, who moves out of the way, disgusted, Brandon falling to the ground. The teacher demands she helps, but she refuses, calling him a pervert, and he orders her to help him up. But when reaching out with her hand, Brandon takes it, his grip getting tighter and tighter, snapping all the bones in her hand. In the principal's office, Caitlin's mom, Erica, is pissed, wanting Brandon thrown in jail and accusing whoever his real father is of being a psycho. Well, it certainly is starting to seem that way. But Tori, ever in denial about her son being anything other than good, declares it to be an accident. And things like this happen all the time. Yeah, maybe like one finger breaking or something, but not crushing her whole damn hand, lady. But the reality about who Brandon is, which has been kept a secret from him all this time, comes bubbling up to the surface that night. Drawn back to the barn by the voices, he begins to decode what they are saying into English, which turns out to be take the world. Ominous enough for you. Tearing the chains off the trapdoor hiding his ship, Tori finds him levitating in the air, the ship glowing beneath him. Again, calmly trying to approach, he loses his concentration, plummeting down the shaft, and on the way down, cutting his hand on the edge of the ship. His first injury that they've ever seen him display in 12 years. Just like with Superman, the only thing that can hurt him is kryptonite from his own planet. Same thing with Brandon here, his ship being also from his planet, it's the only thing that can hurt him. And she is forced to spill the beans about his origins, explaining that he fell from the sky, but that doesn't mean to her that he's not their son, and that she and Kyle truly do love him, believing him to be a miracle from God. But he's not having it, launching into a tirade about them lying to him and feeling betrayed. As he wanders off in his anger, he screams, and lasers fire from his eyes, a twisted turn on Superman's own heat vision. And it's from this moment of the reveal to Brandon of where he came from that the boy is no more. Now completely dominated by his evil alien side, losing the rest of his humanity in the process, which he never truly was in the first place. Though he is still consumed by his infatuation with Caitlin, paying her another visit at home, clutching some flowers for her. Ah, oh, isn't that sweet. He tries to encourage her to not be scared, explaining that he now understands that he's special, but she's not interested, saying her mother told her to never talk to him again. And Brandon's like, oh, in that case, I'll take care of that little problem before suddenly disappearing, showing up at the diner where Erica works. In the middle of closing up shop, suddenly the lights blink. When the lights come back on, seeing the same BB symbol Brandon was drawing earlier scrawled all over the diner's windows. They shatter, along with the overhead lights, the pieces cutting Erica's face, and one falling right into her eye, which she is forced to extra painfully remove. A moment that was horrifying in so many ways. Usually stuff just goes into people's eyes in movies, not having to pull the 
bang, bang out. Yeesh. A figure speedily flies by the room, sending her back to hide in the freezer, which doesn't do much good. Brandon making quick work of it with his laser eyes, cutting the door clean in half and descending upon Erica. Though he assumedly kills her, when the police investigate the scene the next morning, there's no sign of a body. However, the sheriff does discover remnants of the BB logo on the window, which appears to be Brandon's signature, something also synonymous with serial killers, leaving an indicator behind of their deeds. And after the hand smashing incident, Brandon has been ordered to counseling sessions at school with Marilee, Tori's sister, who proves mostly inept at her job. She does try to get him to show any kind of remorse or understanding over his actions, but Brandon is complacent and unwilling to give much of any kind of response, only admitting that he's glad that Tori and Kyle aren't his parents, as he's not the spawn of some backwater couple, but in fact of a superior being. I would say a response like this would warrant some follow-up questions, but she doesn't seem to think so. Even if the thought is maybe this kid is just nuts or whatever, that would still be the kind of answer that you would want to inquire further upon. Oh, you think you're a superior being? What makes you think that? Oh well. And after asking like three more questions and spending maybe five minutes with the kid, she gives up, explaining that without him giving her anything to show progress, Marilee will have to inform the police about the results or lack thereof from their session. This of course isn't what Brandon wants to hear, threatening her that it wouldn't be good for anyone to tell them about this. And it's obvious that anyone who stands in his way or shows that they are against him is going to get killed. As that night discussing things with his friends, including Marley's husband Noah, everything going on has caused Kyle to begin to question the boy, and beginning to wonder if he is maybe truly evil. He offers to give Noah a ride home, as they've been drinking, which he refuses. Bad idea as it turns out, drinking and driving too, but also you gotta watch out for fucking super people from outer space. Brandon surprises Marilee at their house, but before getting the chance to kill her, Noah comes home, finding Brandon in his outfit hiding in the closet. Annoyed, he drags the boy outside to take him home, Brandon pleading with him not to tell his parents, but Noah says that he'll only do that if he's lucky pretty much dooming him to die next. Throwing him up against the garage, the boy vanishes, and Noah, for some reason, hops in his car and begins to drive somewhere. This is a really odd choice, not only because he doesn't know where Brandon is currently, but because he's leaving his wife helpless and alone at their house. It's fine for her and not for him, it turns out, as Brandon attacks the car, smashing through the windows and rendering it unable to function. He then lifts the car into the air, slamming it into the ground face first, the impact causing Noah's jaw to smash into the steering wheel, tearing it almost completely off of his face. Nice score here, terrifyingly gross, so good. Still alive somehow, Brandon stands there, watching for a moment to appreciate what he's done, before approaching a dying Noah, taking a finger to collect some of his blood, drawing his BB symbol on the pavement before leaving. Returning home shirtless after being missing for hours to a worried Kyle and Tori, he gives the lame excuse of having been playing soccer and been bullied by some kids who tore his shirt. Foolish, Tori buys it, but Kyle is isn't so sure. Like, yeah, I don't think so, kid. You weren't playing soccer because you don't have any friends. Nice try, pal. And it's clear that Kyle is starting to really doubt his son. And that night, he has a really cool nightmare sequence retelling the first night they found Brandon. The door into his bedroom leading outside to a forest. There he finds Tori at the freshly landed spaceship clutching the baby. As black goo spills from her mouth and her eyes turn white. The baby's eyes glowing red, then lunging at him. Which seems to indicate that it was actually her desperation for a child that led this whole adopting a space baby thing in the first place. Like she found him and was like, hey, we're gonna adopt this baby. And he's like, Oh, okay, I guess so. Are you sure about this? All right, fine. Let's see how it goes. It didn't go well. They're awoken to a phone call from Marilee at the hospital who relays what happened to Noah. And mentioning that Brandon had been at their house earlier, Kyle again is starting to finally put the pieces together here, thinking that it must have been their son who killed him, despite Tori still insisting otherwise. Kyle remembers back to that bizarre shirtless incident, thinking Brandon must have been hiding it for a reason, finding it jammed behind a dresser and covered in ominous bloodstains. And guess what? Still blinded by her maternal love, Tori writes off the bloodstained shirt, saying they could be any number of things, not specifically blood. I mean, that's crazy, right? That's gotta be like chocolate or something. Realizing she won't ever understand what is becoming a substantial problem, Kyle instead plays a different strategy with his wife, convincing her that he does truly love him and is going to take the boy camping to hopefully mend their relationship, even though he's obviously going to try and futilely kill him. Moments after they leave for the trip, the sheriff shows up with a concrete connection 
connection between the murders, showing Tori the BB symbols left behind at both. And finally, finally, she gets it after all this time. Having the truth shoved in her face and everything, it's kind of hard to deny at that point, I guess. She brushes the sheriff off to his face though, not acknowledging the symbols, but quickly rushes back upstairs to where Brandon keeps his sketchbook, inside seeing the exact same symbol she saw him drawing earlier, along with some colorful drawings illustrating both of the murders. Take the world scribbled repeatedly on every page. After seeing this, it finally dawns on her. Oh shit, I've been protecting an evil alien monster this whole time and he's not normal at all. He's here to kill us all. That is embarrassing. Meanwhile, deep in the woods on their hunting trip, Brandon comes across a pair of deer tracks, going down to look in detail, and Kyle seizes the opportunity to strike, firing directly at the back of Brandon's skull, but the bullet bounces off, unsurprisingly having zero impact on him at all. But it does have an emotional impact, now knowing his supposed daddy isn't really on his side, just as with the others who turned on him, vanishing as Kyle fumbles to reload. Brandon, back in his costume, flies around and appears. Kyle feebly attempts to apologize, but he's already made his intentions clear. And Brandon unleashes his laser eyes on his face, flame broiling a hole through his head. Nice. Understandably worried about Kyle, back at the farm, Tori calls him repeatedly and getting no answer until Brandon answers the phone. Asking where Kyle is, he simply answers that he's gone and that he's coming home, seeing he's floating just outside the farm. He rapidly flies through the house, tearing holes in the wall each time. Tori calling 911 as he continues his destruction, crumbling the house to pieces. The sheriff and deputy arrive on the scene soon after. She rushes outside to meet them, but before she she can even talk to them, Brandon rushes at the sheriff out of nowhere, flying at him, tearing his body into a bloody explosion in an instant. The deputy makes it a bit longer, searching the house for the boy, and he surprises her, appearing in front of and then behind her, grabbing her, tearing her apart, and smashing her into the walls repeatedly until tossing her dead body away. Tori doing her best to hold back screams hiding under the bed as Brandon stalks the house for her. Once he leaves, she makes a break for the upstairs window and hightailing it to the barn. She grabs grabs a shard from the spaceship, which comes off surprisingly easily, calling out to Brandon. Now, if you ask me, I would have just waited at the ship. You know, the one thing that can maybe hurt him? Like hide inside of it or something and pop out. Yeah, gotcha. But she's proved so far she's not always capable of making the wisest choices. And I messed up my chair. I hope you appreciated that little performance art. Now Brandon returns to her. And as before, she pours out her heart to him, promising that she still loves him and removing his hood. And the two embrace as she raises the shard, prepared to stab him. And he stops her, grabbing her hand. And now knowing that she, like everyone else, is actually against him, flies high into the air, clutching his mother, exchanging one last look. He drops her to the ground to her death, falling helplessly from the extreme extreme heights, as lights crest the cloud near him, that of a passenger plane coming right for him. No worries for his indestructible body though, the screen cutting to black and then witnessing the aftermath of a crash, as the next day wreckage of the plane is shown scattered all across the ground, their farmhouse completely destroyed by the plane crashing right into it, and conveniently covering up his parents' deaths in the process, along with no survivors being amongst the 200 plus passengers on the plane. Jeez, Brandon! Sitting in the back of the ambulance, he munches on a cookie with an innocent gaze. Somehow, after all of this, able to escape anyone discovering his murderous personality. And this is only the beginning of his wave of destruction. After his parents' deaths, moving on to killing more people, as we see several underground recordings of other similar cases of him doing so in the area. All part of a conspiracy theorist show run by the crazed The Big T, played by James Gunn regular Michael Rooker, who believes each of these acts of destruction were caused by the same person, whom he refers to as Brightburn. Also works with the BB thing, like his initials, so I guess he's just Brightburn now. That, that sounds better than Brandon whatever anyway. The Big T also shockingly reveals that Brandon isn't the only super being on the planet, specifically referencing a half fish, half man, most likely a reference to Aquaman, and a so-called witch that has been killing people with her chains. I don't know what the hell that's a reference to, maybe Wonder Woman, but a witch woman? I don't know. Showing us that there are potentially many other beings like Brandon out there, and that is not a good thing according to him. Big T shouting and spitting that if we don't stop them now, that our entire planet is doomed. But they all appear to be villains. So are there heroes out there as well? Well, amongst the photos flashed on the screen of potential super beings is another familiar face, the Crimson Bolt. He is not super powered at all, but a mere mortal. So chances are he wouldn't really stand a chance against Brandon if it came down to it, but it was still cool to see him referenced amongst the others here. And it does open the possibility of actual powered heroes out there who might be able to go toe to toe with Brandon and the 
others like him, which really opens up the world story-wise for a potential sequel or continuation, which I actually would like to see. It sounds interesting. Though there is a major aspect to the movie that is left extremely underdeveloped, almost feeling like it was completely forgotten at one point. That involving Brandon's infatuation with Caitlin. Even after he goes full evil, he still seems to harbor some kind of romantic feelings for her in a childlike sense by bringing her the flowers, and then killing her mother who didn't want them to speak. The problem is after doing so, Caitlin is never heard from or mentioned again. It's like why did he even kill her mom if there's no payoff to any of these scenes? It seemed like he wanted them to be together, so this definitely feels like a huge loose end in the final product. Apparently, there was an idea at some point in the script to have her show up at the end and given a robot hand, implying that she would be seeking revenge on Brandon after what happened. But this still misses the seemingly bigger point of the whole story, which ties into why Brandon is here on Earth, which I feel is brought up in an earlier classroom scene. Now, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you know that if there's a classroom scene in a movie, even if presented in a metaphor, it always ties into the story in some way. There, the class is discussing the difference between wasps and bees, both of which utilize high hives, and Brandon mentions a particular kind of predatory wasp. They can't make hives of their own, so they attack others and take over their already pre-built hives. This must also be the case for Brandon's interstellar species. He does appear human on the outside and must have been sent to Earth to not just destroy everything like the wasps, the hive in this case being our planet, but also to help propagate his species, which is where Caitlin factors in. He definitely could have just killed her when he showed up in a room that second time but chose not to do so for a reason. And it appears to me that he has future plans to breed and spread his species, as they would be able to blend in just as he did for all these years. But you know, since they're both 12 at this point, I can see why they didn't even go there with the story. Though it does appear from everything presented, this must be the reason behind his clumsy infatuation. Otherwise, what the heck would be the point of any of those scenes at all? There's quite a bit that feels underdeveloped even beyond these main plot points. And maybe if there is a sequel, they can utilize all that stuff we don't know about to help flesh out a lot of these questions. But since the movie didn't do that well financially or critically, this unsatisfying conclusion with only a hint of bigger stakes teased and never realized is probably all we're gonna get. I did still like the movie for what it set out to do, even though it was very limited, but ultimately it could have gone to a lot more interesting and unique places than it did, beyond only working on the surface level of a slasher movie featuring a superpowered evil being. But oh well, it was still amusing and had good gore and kills, and that is enough on its own for me to be worth a watch. What did you guys think of Brightburn and its ending? What would you like to see explored further in a potential sequel? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.